And we are on Jazz Street with 2018 Rochester Music Hall of Fame inductee Ferdinand J. Smith. Ferdinand, first of all, congratulations on a well-deserved and well-overdue <laughs> honor. Can you give us an idea growing up in the 50s and 60s, I mean, part of that classic radio, Rochester radio community? I can't imagine what it would have been like, especially with your dad. Well, my father did live television, if you remember that. Right. He was also a stand-in for Spencer Tracy, which a lot of people didn't realize. Really? Yes, and when uh, Catherine Hepburn came to Rochester, she remembered my father and said, oh, you still look so much like Spence, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> Speaking of Ferdinand J. Smith here on Jazz 90.1, so that being said, working in television and then getting into radio, why do you, because sometimes parents will say, oh, don't do this, especially with radio and television, but did your where did your dad try to help you in terms of uh, getting into the, the business? It's an interesting question. Both my parents supported me going on radio. Um, I was fortunate enough after some training at McQuaid to get my first job at 15 at WSAY. And my parents always said, listen, you can pursue this, but you better have something to back it up. Because, you know, they would see various... Um, Oh, various announcers on, on the stations that my father worked at and when he did his commercials live. And you'd see them maybe move on or they would cut back or whatever. And they always said, well, just make, you know, just make sure you got something else, too. So talk about when you started with WBBF. Because, I mean, that, that legendary lineup that you guys had for all those years, I can't imagine the, the things you guys saw and what, what you guys experienced. Well, I was the kid. You know, everybody else were guys who'd been around, Nick Nixon, Joe Dean, uh, Jack Pelvino was still a young guy, but I was the kid. I mean, I was 17, and uh, I was a teenager talking to teenagers, and I loved it. And I started all night, and I had, I actually won a scholarship to acting school in New York. And I thought to myself, I went with my dad, but I had this opportunity to work at BBF all night, which was the station. So I was very excited, and... Uh, I decided not to take the scholarship. It was the American Academy of Drama. And uh, I worked all night and switched to Fisher, where I was probably the worst student in their history. <laughs> I'm now on the board, which I find kind of fascinating. But, um, uh, and what a school that's turned out to be. But it was, it was great. I worked all night. I would get off at 6, and I would take my mother and sisters to work and then go to school at 8 o'clock. She can imagine. Didn't work out real well. <laughs> Speaking to Ferdinand J. Smith on Jazz 90.1. So, especially coming up in the early 60s and you hit the British invasion, the Beatles coming through, and being a teenager, being a DJ at that time, my goodness. I'm going to tell you a story. When I was on SAY, the first record I ever played of the Beatles was on VJ Records. Are you aware of VJ Records? I am. Okay. VJ Records, as you know, was the first black record company in America. Strangely enough, years later, and you just brought up to me Donnie Gerard as we were walking here, this man wanted to produce Donnie Gerard, and his name was Calvin Carter. And he, was, he had been the creative force behind VJ Records, Duke of Earl, and all those records. Well, then I noticed the next few weeks later, the Beatles record came out on Capitol. Well, here's what happened, because he became a dear friend and mentor of mine, Calvin Carter. And what happened is they signed the Beatles, and they went bankrupt. Mm. And Capitol Records bought the Masters. When I kissed him goodbye when he died, he said, Verdi, make my story. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. He taught me a lot about music. I, I loved him. Speaking to Ferdinand J. Smith here on Jazz 90.1. So all those years, I mean, especially talking about through the 60s and early 70s and BBF, when did you decide to make that transition to get into the other side, into the advertising side of things? Well, I had been on BBF for eight years, and I moved to Waxy as a sales uh, a promotions guy. Waxy my, was my old boss from BBF. I ended up on the morning show. And um, Larry Black, who was a great announcer, I think he still has a show. I know he was either ill or in a car accident or something, but I think he still has a, like a country western show somewhere. And so I started doing mornings, which I loved. And um, then I was doing commercials for people. As they say, they hire you as talent. And I would change the commercials around sometimes with the client there. And a couple of them said to me, well, why don't you go in the business? And that's how it started. 1973. Yeah, yeah, my brother and I. So now, fast forward all these years later, you got into songwriting, of course, and producing. What a journey. I mean, how did that, I mean, where did you realize, okay, you know, I can write a song to do this, and I can write a song to do that, and then here you are. Well, you know, uh, the band that I managed, and I managed locally, I managed the Invictas, and I managed uh, 
uh, the Rustics, who turned out to be Hall of Famers, great group of guys, still very close friends of mine, those that are surviving. And um, the second Skylark album was supposed to be produced by David Foster. I think you know who he is. Oh, yeah. And I just saw David in Florida just a couple of weeks ago. And um, the guy who produced it, it was terrible, the second album. It just didn't sound right to me. And that's when I started. And I was already doing jingles, so I got got into doing long form. I said, if they can do it, I can do it. So. <laughs> kind of worked out. Yeah, it's been great. I've enjoyed it. Speaking to Ferdinand J. Smith here on Jazz 90.1. So, Ferdinand, anyone wants to get into the business of radio or television, what advice would you give them now? Do anything. Do anything you're asked. My dear friend, now departed, Jeff Goff, who became an Emmy Award-winning director, used to run coffee for Ruin Arledge. And when people come to our place, um, they, I think they learn if they work hard, they can grow. Uh, it was funny, tonight I'm taking a very dear friend of mine who worked with us for many years, who retired early. His wife was ill at the time. And um, he was from Brockport State, and he said he wanted a job. And every time I would turn around, he was standing there behind me, watching. So I hired him, and then for oh God, over 30 years he worked for us. And uh, he just, it, that, that work ethic, I mean, that was driven into me by my parents. My, my parents were workaholics, all my whole family is. And it was, you know, do anything to get ahead. That was it. You know, whatever they asked, do it. I remember I worked at Park Edge Grocery. This is before, you know, when Wegmans exploded and, and uh, they asked if anybody wanted to clean the bathrooms for 50 cents. I said, hey, I'm in. <laughs> That's what you do. Kind of worked out. It did. It did. <laughs> For now, again, congratulations on the success, and thanks again for spending some quality time with us today. You got the great pipes there, pal.